Welcome to today's webinar on the employee retention tax credit. What is it and how do we qualify? My name is Christina Dragonetti and I am the Outreach and Communications Director for the California Association of Nonprofits. Our um, speakers today are Chitra Iyer, Robert Pasquale, and Jan Masaoka. Thanks, uh, thanks, Christina. Um, welcome to everybody. Um, uh, let me just quickly go over the agenda so you know what to expect. Uh, our agenda is basically in three parts today. What the hell is the ERTC and why should we care? Uh, number two, what can I get? And uh, it helps us decide whether it's worth the time and energy. <clears throat> how to claim the credit, uh, Chicho will come back for that. And then we're gonna take questions uh, all through, uh, but we will also try to take some questions at the end. So uh, with 1300 people on this call, we're probably not gonna get to every single person's question, but we're gonna do our absolute best. Uh, I think in the pandemic, one of the things that we have all seen is the importance of government funding to nonprofits. And that, you know, the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, the California, the Small Business Grants Program, these things have just made an enormous difference to literally tens and tens of thousands of nonprofits receiving this kind of federal money that, you know, that kind of money really only comes from, can come from government, that amount of money. And you know what, this program and other programs that nonprofits are eligible for does not just happen. We're a policy alliance at Cal Nonprofits and wanna remind people that every good policy came about because people fought for it, including this one. And in particular, I wanna point something out about this, which is in previous emergencies, federal money has tended to give small businesses uh, tax credits for income tax. Because we don't, we don't pay income tax, corporate income tax, and we don't benefit from corporate income tax uh, credits. So it's because of years of nonprofit advocacy in Washington, D.C., saying benefits to small business need to include nonprofits. And that means when there are tax credits, they need to be payroll tax credits, not income tax credits. So I want you to see this not just as a federal program that dropped out of the sky, uh, but something that nonprofit advocates have made happen over a number of years. Um, so when I first, when ERTC first came to my attention, one of the things I did was I said, I think I'm just going to call two nonprofit CFOs that I know and see what they think about it. So I called two of them. And the first one said, I've never heard of it. Wow, it really sounds like something I should look into. I'm going to look into it right now. And the second one I called said, hey, I just got $100,000. All right. So that made me realize that a lot of people don't know about it. Um, and the opportunity is really great. And we're really lucky that we have that person, that second CFO here today, Rob, turned out to be 134,000, not just $100,000. Um, so just to let you know kind of how this is both a lot of opportunity and shockingly unknown, all right, both of those aspects to it. Uh, so I want to say a couple words about our speakers before we go on. So Chitra is actually, I mean, we hardly ever let people from outside of California onto Cal Nonprofits webinars. So I feel, I hope you feel really honored, Chitra, that you're out of the state. We're still letting you on. And she's, she has done a lot of work helping nonprofits, particularly nonprofits led by people of color, uh, to um, apply for, and succeed in applying uh, for a PPP, for a payroll check. Paycheck Protection Loans and then Forgiveness and also ERTC. So she's really a, a, a great expert on this and we're really lucky to have her. And then, you know, Rob is, you know, he's kind of our poster child here. It's like, you know, it can be done by real humans. He's not an actor, you know, he's act and uh, he's actually gotten that money and he's I, I know from working with him when he, where he was the, the uh, CFO and I was the treasurer at the Asian Pacific Islander Wellness Center, um, that he's really good at uh, explaining numerical things very well. So doing and explaining. So, uh, and then I also wanted to make sure that you're aware of our, our technical team. You just heard from Christina Dragonetti and Henry Duong on our staff is also a part of the back office support here. And our captioner today is um, Ada Mojica. So to thank them as well. Okay, so with that, um, okay, Chitra, tell us what is ERTC and why should we know about it? Great, I'm gonna share my screen right now. And I feel like before I start, what feels very important to say is that I was born and raised in California and am a proud graduate of, of Cal Berkeley along with 
I think nine of my cousins. And so, and I'm, yeah. So my parents lived there, my sister, but yeah, born and raised Bay area. So, uh, but, but talking to you from Brooklyn now, but I, but I appreciate, um, I appreciate this opportunity because I am not currently in California. And I really want to just give a huge shout out, I think, Jen, to your recognizing the importance of the ERTC and the advocacy effort. So I'm super excited that we have the opportunity to share this opportunity with all of you. In terms of what I'm going to cover before we get to like uh, the inspiration piece uh, and the specifics from Rob is a little bit of background on how the payroll tax, how payroll tax credits work why we're just hearing now about the ERTC, and then three key questions that I'm gonna keep coming back to in terms of what you should be considering when thinking about ERTC. So in terms of payroll tax credits, I think there's always this starting question when we think about nonprofits of, do nonprofits even pay taxes because aren't we tax exempt? And to be clear, nonprofits are tax exempt in the sense that nonprofits don't pay the corporate tax. But in terms of being a contributing taxpayer in society, what you can see is this is the federal budget and how much right different taxes contribute to that. And what you can see that is that payroll taxes have become an increasingly significant part of the overall federal budget. So in fact, nonprofits should recognize that we are taxpayers and actually contribute. There was a time where the where corporate taxes and payroll taxes were about the same, but increasingly there's been a burden put on payroll taxes covering more and nonprofits are paying those payroll taxes. So there is an identity, I think an important identity association here to recognize uh, that we are exempt from a tax, but not you know taxes in general, and that's important. In terms of payroll taxes, I think we often think about, I think if we can sort of flash back to when we first started working, the shock when you get your first paycheck and it is so much lower than you thought it would be. Uh, and <laughs> I don't know if we ever get over that, but, uh, and so that's a mix. And it's a mix of taxes that are being withheld from you as an employee, as well as Medicare and Social Security, and then there's employer taxes on top of that. In terms of payroll taxes, what we're talking about specifically are FICA taxes, Social Security and Medicare. And then, so individuals uh, have this withheld from them as employees, and then employers pay for it. And so when we're talking about the payroll tax credit, we are looking at the portion that an employer, like a nonprofit, pays on top of salary. Those are the only things that we're focused on. So while employers might pay additional taxes, that's not what's included in the ERTC. Payroll providers are important here because they're making regular deposits to the US Treasury of these FICA taxes, as well as what is being withheld. There's an electronic system that essentially allows a payroll provider to transfer funds from your bank account to the US Treasury on a regular basis. There's a program called the EFTPS, just as an FYI, and, and again, you'll get these slides and be able to do these links. Even if you have a payroll provider, if you ever wonder if your payroll provider is making these deposits on time and paying enough, and maybe your payroll provider is very cheap and you're wondering if they're doing a good job, you can actually cross-check. The IRS actually encourages you to have access to this, even if you're not the one uh, doing the deposits, because ultimately, as the employer, you are responsible. Every quarter then, there is a, a, your payroll provider or your PEO files a 941, PEOs file an aggregated 941. We all understand tax returns because we recently hopefully have submitted or gotten the extension. A return is essentially a time that you're reconciling. And so they're making sure that the payments that they have been made, including the FICA payments are accurate. And so on a quarterly basis, we're reconciling. Why this is really, well, Let's talk one more thing and then I'll go through it. In terms of it's a payroll tax credit, so we just talked about what payroll taxes are. This is also a refundable payroll tax credit. What this means is let's say your payroll tax liability for the quarter is 20,000 and you're eligible, you, you find out through this webinar that you're eligible for $15,000 in payroll tax credits. You already have deposited, because remember that your payroll provider is depositing on a regular basis these, these uh, payroll tax credits. So your payroll provider has deposited the 20,000, you realize you have a 15,000 credit. So you understand that the payroll tax liability for the quarter reduces to $5,000. 
in practical terms, like what do you do with this information? A couple of things could happen. I mean, the thing that will definitely happen is you're going to file for all $15,000 in tax credits. Overall, that's going to increase your net income by $15,000. That could mean you get cash back um, as income. Um, you could also have the money as a credit. It gets uh, towards payroll. I'm not going to go into all the details. The thing that I want you to understand is that your net income goes up either way, whether you see it as a reduction in expense or an addition in income. But here is the magical part about a refundable payroll tax credit. Let's say your liability for the quarter is 15000 and you find out that you're eligible for $20,000 in payroll tax credits. How much do you get back? So this is the magic, is a refundable tax credit is not just an offset. You actually can get more money back than you put in. So if you qualify for $20,000 in a tax credit, but you only spent $15,000 in payroll taxes, it doesn't, then you have, then the same thing, the same logic applies. You file for $20,000, your net income goes up by $20,000. So it can feel a little strange that, wait, I can get even more. It's the joy of a refundable tax credit, but how does that work? And I, something that we will uh, go back to, and I think Rob will talk a little bit, of, a bit about in terms of double dipping is payroll taxes are not actually the, uh, the content that's being reimbursed. They are a currency. So like I said, your payroll provider is regularly transferring money from your bank account to the US Treasury, every quarter they're reconciling it. So there is a way in which there is a straight shot between the Treasury and your bank. And what they, the reason they do this as a payroll tax credit is not because there's something special about payroll taxes, it's just the currency. There's an already an existing system that allows money to move back and forth. So the expense that's being reimbursed or credited is, your, is an employee's qualified wages, which I'll talk about more. The reason that that's gonna be important is for nonprofits, we're always thinking about the importance of not double dipping. And so when we're claiming tax credits, we are looking at salary and healthcare expenses for our employees that have not been reimbursed by other funding sources. You're not actually looking at the amount of your payroll taxes. You're looking at your salary and healthcare amounts and those amounts that haven't been yet allocated. Again, Rob's gonna talk more about and has a really beautiful spreadsheet on how you can work this out, but this is an important thing to realize is payroll taxes is the medium, but actually not the substance of what we're talking about here. Here's the link if you want more on healthcare. So teach us. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we're getting some questions from people saying, you know, we want to start with eligibility if we can. So let's make sure we get to that. Yes, we're going to get to eligibility. Yeah, I'm going to get to eligibility. My, this is my quick, this is my quick pitch on why you're hearing about this now, which is just when the ERTC first came out, which is in March 2020, they had both the PPP and the ERTC. So it's been around for a while, but at that point, you were only allowed to apply for one. As Jan mentioned, thanks to amazing right, advocacy by non, a bunch of nonprofits, right, including Cal Nonprofits, this was reversed on December 28th, where suddenly they said, oh, remember when we said you couldn't get both? You can, and we're gonna tell you this over winter break. And we're gonna tell you this at the same time that we announce second draw PPP and put a deadline on that. It's hard to pay attention then also because I think the second draw PPP took precedence. And again, then in March, it got extended through December 31st. So if you feel like, wait, did I miss something? You didn't. You weren't eligible for it until December 28th. Your attention may have gone to second drop PPP, and now you have time, so we're fine. Okay, eligibility. I'm getting there. So let's first talk about what an eligible employer is. An eligible employer is all employers of any size, including tax exempt organizations. Self-employed individuals are not considered employers unless they pay employees. So the basic thing is, are you paying payroll taxes? Self-employed individuals pay self-employment taxes where you cover both, both sides of the FICA. Then you're not an employee. But if you have anyone who has employees and pays payroll taxes is eligible. The only ineligible employers are federal and state government entities and instrumentalities. If you 
again, I have a link here where you can find out more if you're in this sort of ambiguous government category, but everyone else qualifies. Size is going to matter for the amount of the credit, but not for eligibility. If you have one person who you pay payroll taxes for who's an employee, you're eligible. So Chitra, a number of people have asked, do churches and temples and yes. religious organizations qualify? As long as you as long as you have employees that you pay payroll Great. taxes for. Thank and you. and yeah. Great. Just to confirm that. Thank you. Everybody, you're all in. There's so we so we that was eligible organizations, but now we have to actually qualify for the credit. So there's two pathways to eligibility. You can do one or the other or a combination for different periods. Importantly, you don't have to fulfill both of these. Either a significant decline in gross receipts or you fully or partially suspended operations due to a government order. I'm gonna walk through both of these. So a significant decline in gross receipts. And what's interesting is I'm just gonna say they say significant decline and what you will see is it turns a little bit into a decline. When for 2020, they say that you need a 50% reduction in gross receipts in the calendar quarter of 2020 compared to 2019. Most of you will be familiar with this calculation because you looked at gross receipts for purposes of second draw PPP. So you likely have this amount. 50% is more stringent than the PPP was, which was 25%. So I wanna flag that. Um, I'm also flagging that similar to PPP, your fiscal year doesn't matter here. They want it on calendar quarters. So they want you to compare January through March, 2020 to January through March, 2019. So regardless of what your fiscal year is, you're comparing a calendar quarter. Here's where they start to make this a little bit easier. As long as you have one quarter that meets this requirement, they started, <laughs> they've started handing out bonus quarters. So they've now said, if you get one quarter, the next quarter comes in free. It doesn't even matter if there is a reduction. So if you had one quarter with 55% reduction, and then the next quarter, you had an 80% increase, you get that next quarter automatically. So significant decline, yes, but once you have it once, then they've, basically are trying to give the money away. You can do multiple quarters, either until December 31st or the end of a quarter with less than a 20% reduction. So what this means is if you have one, if, if your quarter two, for example, was 60%, your quarter three was 30% reduction, and then your quarter four, you had an increase, you would get all three quarters. You get until the end of a quarter that has less than a 20% reduction. So that is for 2020. For 2021, right? So remember I said sig that, that significant decline, the, lang the meaning of it starts to change. Now they're looking for greater than a 20% reduction, which is less than you needed for PPP, interestingly. These are 2021 quarters compared to 2019. So you've done half the work here, again, if you prepared for your second draw PPP, because you know your gross receipts amounts for, for 2019, you're now comparing your 2021 calendar quarter. Similar to 2020, there are, there are bonus quarters. The very first bonus is they tell you if you had greater than a 20% reduction in Q4 of 2020, you automatically get Q1 of 2021. If you have greater than a 20% reduction of Q1, you automatically get Q2. They have not yet released guidance of Q3 and Q4 if there are going to be bonus. So again, there are their standard ways of applying. Once you get a qualifying quarter, you will get the subsequent quarter and maybe even more. This is just a reference guide. I'm not going to go through this, but basically on the left is how you qualify for the quarter on its own and how you could qualify for it as a bonus quarter. So you, this is just a reference guide because it can feel a little bit overwhelming. The main thing, if it feels a little bit easy, meaning like, how come I get this next quarter? They're trying to help you, right? So they want you to meet it by one quarter and then the next quarter, they're gonna, it's gonna be a bonus. So gross receipts is the first way that you qualify. Separately, you can qualify based on shutdown. This is the language is your operations were either fully or partially suspended due to a COVID-19 related governmental order. Again, similar to 
there was very strong language for the gross receipts reduction, talking about a significant decline. Fully or partially suspended sounds very dramatic. What we're going to see in practice is that it is easier to meet this requirement than this language would have you think. First of all, it's important that you think about what a government order is. I have some examples here of government orders. What you'll see is they have the word order in it, right? Proclamation, order, and there's a must. So it's not a, it would be a good idea. I recommend that people stay home. It's not statements from a, it's not statements. Some people have referred to uh, these tax credits as blue state tax credits because blue states had a lot more orders, government orders for businesses to shut down. If you were a responsible executive director of a nonprofit and said, maybe we shouldn't go in, but your local government did not order that, you actually don't get the benefits of these. So good job, California, I guess, until today or something, but you've had orders um, asking you. So you're looking at any order, whether it be at the state or local level that affects it and is an order rather than a recommendation. Teacher, yes. we have a couple of questions I just wanna to touch on here. So first sure. of all, um, one of the things that people we're hearing people ask is, so when you say grant, grant gross receipts, that means all income, right? Whether it's a grant or an individual donation or a fee for service, okay, right. Okay, and then another one is, you know, um, uh, when you talk about double dipping, if does that mean only like, for example, if somebody gave you a, a grant that was specifically for a particular project, um, does that mean that you can't count that salary? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that, that is what I mean. I can, I have, I, so, so it has to be a government grant. If you had a, it doesn't mean a, it's any, any restricted, I mean, double dipping by definition is double dipping would mean that you are being reimbursed by two separate sources for the same expense. That okay. reimbursement can come at the hands of a private funder or a government funder. But so my understanding though, is that if the grant is just for a specific project as opposed to a specific salary, then sure. count. is that right? Yes, it depends on how strict the allocation right. is, right? And right. some, and, and I guess something to say here about double dipping mm -hmm. and sort of private funding is often we have habits of allocating grants in certain ways because we always get this one funding and I use it for the salary, but it's actually not mandated by the funder that I do that. I could right. actually do it differently. So there is a difference on on restricted funding that has been specified by the funder and then funding that you have internally made decisions around allocating. And so there's some flexibility there. Great, thanks. Okay, so after, so we, one thing is sort of government order. And these are some examples of how your workplace may have been affected. And I've taken these examples directly from the IRS and you can again link and read in detail. A lot of the examples are focused on restaurants, which feel hard to compare to nonprofits. These three felt um, felt like you could make the comparison. So as I go through these, what I'd love you to do is just to think about, and you can even put in the chat, like which one resembles you, and then we'll see whether you qualify. The first is a physical therapy facility. They used to offer services in person. They had to shut down uh, because they are not considered an essential service, and they still offer physical therapy, but remotely now. They have less tools available because they're not in the, in the same gym and not everyone is able to attend remote sessions. One thing I wanna flag here is there is no mention of hardship. They aren't saying, and people took much longer to recover from their, their messed up IT band, I might be projecting here, or the, it's really hard for the trainers. Maybe some trainers loved it because they didn't have to commute. Maybe some people loved it because they're more likely to stick with it because they're using what's in their home. I say this because I think many nonprofits have really effectively pivoted to remote. It's not a question of whether you were able to do it effectively or not. The question is, is it comparable? It doesn't mean you suffered. So I think that's really important. They, there's no mention of hardship. It's just, it's not the same. The second thing is, uh, the second example the IRS provides is a software firm where uh, employees are already allowed to work some days of the week remotely. They do show up when they work with clients at a business location, either people coming to their office or them going to people's offices. After the order, they are forced on mandatory telework and all of their client meetings are now remote that used to be in person. The final example is a research, a scientific research company where some 
uh, employees do computer-based modelings and other uh, others do work in a lab. The once they go to mandatory telework because they are non-essential, the ones who've been able to do computer-based modeling are able to work remotely and once they get the you know monitors they need and lab-based employees do administrative work and what I just want to flag here on the administrative work is I think of these as your program staff people who always have admin work responsibilities but often are too busy to submit their receipts to you their job has administrative components they might not be doing it all the time what happens here is these employees are doing administrative work but it is not outside of their job responsibility. So it's not that they got new jobs, it's just that they can't do the lab work they were doing before. Um, but this isn't new administrative work. It's just like, well, I guess I'll catch up on all of these things that I was too busy to do before. So these are our three examples. And so what, what I'd love you to just think about is who do you resemble? Um, because I think that can help to think about uh, whether you qualify. So you're thinking about it and here are the answers. Both the physical therapy and the scientific research company are, they do count because they say it's not comparable. Again, you might be more effective, you might get more work done, people might love it, people might hate it, doesn't matter, it's not comparable. This one they say no. And so part of it is like, well, they used to have in-person meetings. The IRS doesn't go into detail, but what I understand this to mean is meetings with clients, right, serving people might be different kinds of interactions than uh, then business meetings that can be remote because part of what they say is they do client work. Maybe they start with an in-person meeting and move remotely already. So the nature of the in-person isn't crucial to the to what's happening here. The next question is for the scientific research company. If you're sort of like, well, we mostly are like a software firm, but we do a few in-person things. Does it count? So like, imagine you're the scientific research company. The next question is what proportion of your people had to do the lab work in order to qualify? Like if most of what you do can be done like the software company, how many physical therapists do you need? So what if some people are able to operate comparably because you've always been doing things primarily, you know, via the computer, the in-person is nice, but not necessary and others aren't. So I just want you to guess that what the IRS says is more than a nominal portion of your business needs to be operating in not in a non-comparable manner to the pre-pandemic times. So this is what I feel like, this is like my big reveal because I think this is really amazing is the IRS is defining more than nominal as 10% or more. I've linked to this and done the exact thing because I feel like this can feel a little bit too good to be true. The other thing that's important for me to flag here is the IRS has not added this to their FAQs. It is in guidance that was issued on March 1st. The guidance is 102 pages. <laughs> I'm giving you the relevant section, but it can feel a little bit like, wait, really? So that's why I wanna make sure you have this because what this means is that again, if you are mostly, if you think of yourself as mostly like the software firm, as long as there's a 10% or more either of the hours work, meaning of your staff time, right? Or the gross receipts. So thinking of your cost centers or where your funding comes in is, was, uh, has, is no longer comparable, you qualify. You qualify for the entire organization. How much money are we talking about here? For 2020, we're looking I'm at, sorry, oh yeah, yeah, I go ahead. I wonder if we can just get a couple more questions in and then go to this, yes, yes, uh, yep. the calculation part. Yes, sure. It's more of Rob's section. So a couple of them, one is that um, if, in terms of gross receipts, um, if you've got a PPP forgiveness amount of money, do you need to count that as gross receipts or not? That's a great question. We actually, the IRS, so, it's an open question. The SBA was explicit that you do not count it in their gross receipts. So the SBA has very specific guidance on that. The IRS has not confirmed that they are using that same approach. So, mm -hmm. so PPP and EIDL grant advances were not part of the PPP second draw calculation for gross receipts. For the ERTC, the IRS hasn't confirmed that that's their approach. Mm -hmm. We anticipate that it's coming soon. And part of it is if that makes the difference, I would check if you qualify for that quarter on a different basis, if that's going to make the difference in not meeting the test until the IRS confirms that they're using the same approach as the SBA. 
So you're saying it's a theological question and kind of things so interpreting that. It's a religious question, not like one that can be easily answered. I, um, I think, I mean, it's and, been yeah. answered. It's been answered by the SBA. It's right, not been yeah. answered yet by the IRS. Yeah. Great. Okay. And then, you know, we have a number of questions from people that are fiscally sponsored by a fiscal sponsor. So my understanding is that the fiscal sponsor could apply for the funds, yeah. but not the projects can't apply separately. Just want to confirm that. Confirm. Con yeah. It confirmed okay. if, if, if the fiscal. Uh, the, if the fiscal sponsor is the one doing payroll, if you uh -huh. are considered employees right. of them, again, the employer is who's claiming this. Great. Okay. Thanks. I just want to remind us that we're a little behind time here. So. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna go quickly. I'm gonna go to Rob. Like, actually, I'm just gonna say, there's a lot of money. <laughs> it's up to five thousand for 2020, and in 2021, it's seven thousand dollars per an employee per quarter. So it's a lot of money. Rob is going to talk to us about how to get it. And there's different ways of applying for it either before the end of the quarter or after the quarter. The main thing I want to flag here is you have up to three years afterwards. The money isn't going anywhere in the same way. Like if you don't pay your taxes, they don't forgive it. If you're owed a tax credit, it's still there. So we can chill. And now we will go to how we get $134,000. Just want to tell people we sort of joked ahead of time that maybe we should have called this webinar something like this one weird trick will get you $134,000. Okay. Thanks for being with us, Rob. Sure, sure. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, here we go. And let's see. Okay. So um, I'll talk about, I, I was with, another, with, with an organization. I've recently gone back into consulting, but um, back in March, I was with my former organization and she, I found out through Chitra that there was uh, this ERTC. So I went ahead and went through the process and applied. Uh, the first question, of course, I had to answer was how did we qualify? And I ran through our gross receipts and we did not have a reduction in gross receipts uh, uh, to meet the minimum requirements. Uh, however, we did have a reduction in operations through government orders. We are located in San Francisco. So, and San Francisco did, you know, shut down, issue a shelter in place ordinance. And I, what I did to uh, substantiate that is just kept copies of all of those documents. I dug them up. Some of them I didn't have in my email. So I went to the government website and they actually had them. And I just downloaded the PDF and I'm just saving that. I didn't have to send those documents anywhere. I'm just holding on to them in case the IRS says, hey, what's going on? So um, so I just just grab any copies you can of the official memos, press releases, et cetera, stating that there was some required uh, reduction in operations that affected your organization. The way it affected our organization is we provided legal services to clients on a one-on-one -on -one basis, usually in person. Those had to go to remote. But the most important part was we provided computer training in person to individuals who could no longer come to the office. And then it's really hard to do computer training over the computer. So that became almost a non-possible uh, situation. So we did find a workaround, but um, you know, that did significantly affect our operations. Um, and then, you know, so yes, we qualify. Now, should I go through the trouble of, of going through it? Um, so these are the questions I asked myself when I uh, started this process. Uh, do we have enough employees paid out of general operating funds? This organization was about a $10 million organization with lots and lots of government contracts paying for program activities, right? Um, mostly state, uh, fe uh, mostly city contracts, but we had a few federal contracts and some foundation grants. Um, but we actually did have a significant portion of our staff, largely our fundraising staff, who were not paid for by anybody. They just come out of the general money that's left over from all of that, as well as our administrative staff. Um, the way our contracts work with the city and the federal government is we, we do get an indirect cost uh, allowance on these contracts, as I'm sure most of you are familiar with indirect cost allowances, we use the de minimis rate. We don't have a negotiated indirect cost rate. We just use a de minimis, de minimis rate allowed by each of these entities. And we do not need to prove out or assign specific individuals to this indirect cost. So all of those individuals, we determine were paid out of general funds because the indirect cost is a general fund kind of payment. It's not 
you know, we're not accountable to that. Uh, so I went through the staffing and realized, yes, we do have a lot of people who aren't being charged to contracts, aren't being uh, paid for through grant money. And then finally, do, was the data available? We use a payroll service and they filed the 941 for us. We don't, we use, you know, they do the file 941. They say it's ready to download at the end of each quarter. And we simply just, you know, file it away in our files. We don't really review it until audit time. And we just, then we do the reconciliation between the 941 and our um, audit documents. So the auditors say, yes, everything's clean. Uh, so we do have those 941. So I took a look at those and that's all you need if you have it. So how do you do it? Uh, the first thing I did, now this is, I'm showing you a sample uh, worksheet. I have given uh, Cal Nonprofits uh, this worksheet as a template, and hopefully they'll give you a link that you can download this yourself. And it's multiple tabs. Um, and the one I'm showing you now is the tab for one quarter, right? Uh, so I just have these employees. Let me, let me uh, highlight this. So, you know, we have... Um, laser pointer. So we have the employees here. This is their salary per quarter here. And then I looked at how did we allocate? Hopefully you are already doing this if you have multiple grants and multiple funding sources. I, this shows me how much of each employee's salary was allocated to funding source one, funding source two, funding source three, et cetera. Here's some money that was allocated to the PPP loan, right? Here's some more money allocated to a different PP, to the PPP loan in a different program. And then here's uh, general funds. So these are the employees that were paid for just out of the organization's general funds, not charged, this portion of their salary was not charged to a funding source. Like you can see this one employee, number 114, is spread in several ways. Part of it was paid for the P, by the PPP, but a large portion was still paid for out of general funds. So, then I just, on the final column, I just sum up all of the general funds amounts to get how much is eligible. So that's about $17,000. This is not hey, the Rob, actual. Rob, I'm sorry. I'm, this is Christina. I'm just going to jump in here for a second. Folks are saying that they can't see your laser pointer. Oh, let me try this again. Um, and I just wanted to also mention to folks that if you look in the chat, there's a link to the sample worksheet that you guys can pull up and follow along. My computer is not. Oh no, I have to wait for my program to respond. It's my, uh, my PowerPoint is frozen. <laughs> Here we go. Um, nope, it's still frozen. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Yeah, you know, my PowerPoint is still frozen. So the final column on the right says general funds, and those are just the salaries that uh, were paid for out of general funds, and there's a total of $17,478.30. So hopefully you have something like this already. If you don't, then you can download the spreadsheet and um, you know, track it this way. Um, and I, I would say it's useful to do this so you can make sure that you're not over or under allocating people across your organization. Teacher, while he's doing that, let me ask you another question from the from the yep. Q&A box. Um, so there's still a little bit of unclarity about PPP and small business loan, California small business loan. So if you got money um, from PPP um, or from California small business loan program, does that mean that that and you use those to pay certain people's salaries? Does that mean that those salaries are now ineligible for this? I no. yeah, believe so. Well, I, I think it depends on there's there's some guidance from the IRS on how much uh, when you apply for forgiveness, for example, you say you you might list a lot more salary than you actually need for forgiveness. And so what they say is anything that's in excess of what's required is available for you to use. So originally they said if you listed it on the forgiveness application, it was out. They have changed that guidance to say, so if, if your overall payroll costs were 100,000, but you listed 300,000, you still have uh, 200,000 available. So the fact that you listed it doesn't make it out, except you want 
uh, accept what's necessary to meet your forgiveness. So there's some flexibility there, but in general, as a general approach, it's good to maximize, if you haven't applied for forgiveness yet, it's good to maximize those non-payroll expenses so that you are, uh, you have more, you have more flexibility on where to allocate your payroll costs as a general approach. If that makes sense. Rob, I have shared the slide that I think you're on now. Um, All right, so we great. We have to try and work with your PowerPoint. <laughs> Okay, great. So thank you, Christina. So um, on this, this is the summary page. This is the first tab of the spreadsheet that you, you can download. Uh, this summarizes each quarter. Uh, so you can see in this first quarter, which is the second column after employee numbers, you can see that amount again of 14478 And it just picks up the salary. So you do this for every quarter. And the math will check out, okay, uh, if you look at employee 151, they earned $13,675.95. The maximum eligible was $10,000. So we can get a credit of $5,000 against that. So the math, the spreadsheet is set up so it maxes out. Um, if it's more than 10,000, it'll limit it to 10,000. Um, and then anything that's in pink you, is just less than the maximum. Um, and then you follow the, the second quarter, uh, so I did this for Q3 of 2020 and Q4 for 2020. The reason I didn't do it from March through June of 2020 is because we'd already closed our books. We are on a, we were on a July 1 fiscal year. So I didn't want to mess with that because we'd already turned over the, the general ledger to the auditors. So, um, you know, that, that was closed. So we didn't want to, I didn't want to go back and make that any more difficult. So I just started with July 1st. We could have qualified in March through June, but it was just more trouble than it was worth. Um, so this, this is a slimmed down version. Of course, it's not all the data. This only shows 40 in the far right corner, uh, bottom corner, total credit is 41,000. That's just a portion of what we were eligible to uh, apply for. We were able to apply for $134,000 in tax credits. I submitted it in March of 2021. And uh, as far as I understand it, we have not gotten the cash yet, but the IRS has acknowledged receipt of the uh, 941X form. I think that's all I have, unless there's a specific question I can answer. Uh, Rob, a number of people are typing in that they really like this, having a worksheet like this. And just want to remind people that we're going to, um, you know, in a couple of days, you'll get a link to this recording as well as the slide. So, um, but we've also put the link to the spreadsheet in the chat box. So thank you. Okay, and we're back to you, Chitron. So what is this? How do I actually apply in it? Like, for example, is my payroll tax, you know, my, my uh, payroll tax provider, are they going to be helpful or are they going to be a problem? I think it's going to depend on who your payroll tax provider is. Uh, I think I'm going to just pull up my slides for a second. Sorry, I don't know why it's not letting me one second, I'm just gonna show, I have a slide on this. Oh, Rob, go ahead. And while you're, while you're pulling that up, I, we went outside of our payroll service provider just to reduce any complications. I just took the 941s and submitted the forms back to the IRS directly. And, and at, on the form, they'd say, how do you want the money? Do you want it as a credit? I said, give it to us as a check. So, uh, so I just bypassed the payroll service provider. I talked to them first and they said that was probably the easiest to do. And we were using, um, Pay, uh, uh, tracks payroll. And this this chart is helpful just to understand how you apply for it. As, as remember at the beginning, I talked about the 941s. They get filed at the end of the quarter for uh, for organizations. Your payroll provider can can do it for you because they're already filing for it. The thing is, is this is a reminder similar to the PPP where we realized that it's amazing that they expanded these opportunities for nonprofits, but they didn't necessarily customize it, right, for nonprofits. And so what's challenging often for nonprofits to be able to know this by the end of the quarter is often we're making allocations later because you're thinking about where to apply all the grants. So knowing exactly how much, how many, how much you can apply in wages and healthcare for the ERTC by the exact end of your quarter can feel really challenging to do it in real time, which is the form 941. The 941X you file after the fact. So an X just means it's a revised version of it. And again, you have three years. I have a star here because 
it depends. You So you can apply this on your own. So if you are Rob, you, you can do this. You can fill out a 941X on your own or your payroll provider can do it for you or your PEO. What I'll say here, and I don't think PEOs are as popular in California as they are in, in New York, as far as I understand, some of the PEOs are not allowing employers to do it on their own. So they're saying they have to do the 941X for you. So if we do the next steps, part of what I think is really important, like if we go back to, again, these three questions, am I eligible? So you're going to check your eligibility in terms of having employees and then looking at either the gross receipts or the shutdown order, recognizing that the shutdown order is not the best term. It's are you operating in a comparable way? I saw that some of the questions were about essential services. If you were able to do some of them, but not all of them, remember that as long as more than 10% 10% or more, you're good. So the shutdown is the language, but when you look at the details, it's operating in a comparable manner. The second is calculating how much you can receive. Again, you can use Rob's amazing spreadsheet to help you figure this out. You're you're focusing on salary and healthcare expenses that haven't been allocated anywhere. This is the math. It's up to uh, 5,000 in 2020 and up to $7,000 per quarter per an employee in 2021. And finally, this might be actually your first step. um, It's how you will claim the credit. And is it the 941X? Is it you? Is it your payroll provider? Talk to your payroll provider to find out uh, what their process is, then you can make an informed decision. You can also email me uh, for follow-up support. I think part of it right now, the, the big thing I want to be your takeaway is you have three years. And so it, it's great and important to do this, but you all have been under so much stress this year and everything feels like it's gonna run out. Tax credits are guaranteed. They aren't going anywhere. I would love for you to get on this, but from a space of spaciousness and freedom, uh, not from a everything is overwhelming. So if you need to take time, you have it here and it's not going to go anywhere. I, I want you to know that it's available, but they aren't disappearing. And so this could be one thing that is a pleasant thing to think about the money you're going to get, but you don't have to. It's sort of a you get to have this as an opportunity. And so I don't want any part of this to feel like, you know, act now or it's gone. It, it is not, that is not the case. And so you can also relax, I think. That's all I have. Okay, we have a few questions that I hope that Rob or Chitra, um, one of you uh, has a great answer to it. So, you know, one is that when we talk about gross receipts, is that cash basis or is that accrual? This is, I know this However, is a religious question, but yeah, for the person. No, no, I, well, it's, it's how, it's how you, it's already, it's basically essentially how you do your calculate. You want to be consistent with how you already do your calculations. I know we're using the Q&A box, but I'm just putting in the chat right now just because it's open in front of me. Uh, My colleagues at at FMA did, I didn't do it so I can brag about them. They did a really good gross receipts analysis. How do you calculate gross receipts? It's based on the 990. There's a really nice chart at the end. Everything you wanna know about gross receipts is in there. The only thing, because this was prepared for the second draw PPP loans, not for the ERTC, is again, the SBA was explicit that PPP, forgiven PPP amounts and the EIDL grant advance was not included. The IRS hasn't confirmed it. But all other questions about gross receipts, you have you have a guide and you want to be consistent with how your 990 works so your auditor is your friend here like so it depends on how you've been doing those calculations generally you're the main thing here is you're going to be consistent with whatever approach you've been using to fill the 990. Rob did you want to add anything to that? Okay um and uh, there's a lot of questions about what kind of help can I get. So one question, I know that both of you are available to help people and they're, 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 you're putting your addresses. And so, um, so we have two experts here who can also be engaged privately to help you um, with this. But we also have a couple of specific questions about for-profit firms that are, that are offering to do this on commission. 
uh, where they instead of paying them a fee, you would get a they would get a purport, a portion such as fifteen percent of the amount that you get back. And I'm wondering what you two think about that. What do you think, Rob? Um, <laughs> I I just that's new to me. Um, you know, it's I guess it's like those uh, contingency attorneys, right? You get nothing, you pay nothing, but odds are you're going to get something. So yeah, I, I think you need to think about how much you potentially will get and what that potential fee is versus this is not a lot of time. I mean, if the, if the data is readily available, if you've already been doing your allocation uh, on a month to month or quarter to quarter basis to determine who you're charging of specific contracts and grants, this took me a few less than four hours to put together, right? Uh, for the organization, for a $10 million organization, but the, red, the data was readily available. Um, so if you're going to charge, if a consultant is going to charge you for four hours of work, you have to determine, you know, is that more or less than 15% of what you might get back? Mm -hmm. I would just add to that, that I would look at to see if the consultants are specialized in nonprofits or not. I think the real difference here is that Nonprofits have to be really careful of, again, around double dipping, not because it's going to affect your ability to get the credit. I think the bigger danger is you get the credit, but you've gotten it through double dipping, which is going to be a problem for your audits and your books. And I think many of you may have experienced with the PPP loan is that there is not a general understanding of nonprofit finance that often the lenders are like, we don't understand and I think they mean to say your finance is far more sophisticated than our level, but they never say it like that. They just say it's wrong. And what I would worry about is uh, any firm that doesn't specialize in nonprofits, they will make more money by getting you more credits. And it's actually important to have someone who's familiar with nonprofit finance who knows which funds to disallow. And so that's, and the thing is, this is the amount of work you need to do, like, in order to get the number right, like you still have to do what Rob did for the consultant because they don't know, they're not going to know that. And I think at that point, you've done so much labor, you might as well just file it for yourself. I, <laughs> I don't know. Again, if you've got complicated, if you have easy finances, you can do it on your own. If you have complicated finances, you're going to have to do a bunch of labor anyhow. So I'm not sure unless they are a specialized nonprofit finance consultant, then mm -hmm. of course, but the for business there's such a major difference and they are incentivized to if it's percentage they want you to get a bigger credit and i worry about people's ability to have the level of discernment that's needed for nonprofit finance thanks okay so we only have i don't know 400 more questions so um so everybody can just stay on and we'll get to them one at a time um now let's move to the next slide quickly i wanted to um uh, to remind everybody that, you know, in this short period of time, we cannot cover all of these questions. And there's actually a, a Chinese phrase um, that's about viewing wildflowers from horseback. And the idea is that in a short period of time, you can see a lot of wildflowers from horseback, but you can't see any of them very closely. And that's kind of what this webinar has been. It's meant to have been something pretty quick uh, to give you a sense of whether it's something you where you want to come back to a particular patch of wildflowers um, and take closer look. And just to remind you, this has been free for all 1,300 participants today, and that's because of our Cal Nonprofits members. And uh, membership dues represent 40% of our organization's income. So I'm hoping that you'll consider, if you are not already a member, if you'll consider joining and not only supporting things like this, but you also get, uh, you know, a lot of discounts on a lot of different things. And, you know, but the great feeling that you're helping make things like this uh, free for as many people as possible. Uh, again, thank Thank you very much to Chitra and Rob, and um, a reminder that you will get these slides um, uh, and uh, in the email uh, to um, on Monday. Uh, so you have the weekend off, okay? On Monday you can start applying. All right. So thanks to everybody. Thanks again to our back office staff and and the captioner. Um, have a great rest of your Friday, everybody. <laughs>